uh, this is the session officially entitled Liberalism, even though you know we're talking about that for an entire two days. Uh, my name is Clea Bourne and I am a lecturer in the Department of Media Communications and Cultural Studies here at Goldsmiths. And we have a great session for you today. Um, and I think the perspective is going to be quite interesting. I know some many of many people will have attended yesterday, so you'll be quite happy that today we're now going to take a step back in time and look at some of the the origin story um, and to hear some of the perspectives that maybe weren't voiced yesterday. But if today is your first day at the conference, I can't think of a better session to start with because we're going to take you back to those early years of The Guardian. And I think even better uh, to hear the voice of Manchester. I think that's going to come out in this session, which I'm particularly happy about. Um, because it's a whole area of the history that I didn't know about myself, and I've so enjoyed reading uh, Capitalism's Conscience. Um, I'm not just saying that because Des Friedman is currently my boss, um, but it's really been a very enjoyable read, and I think it now goes on my list of books that you should own when you first moved to Britain. Um, you know, I sort of looked around for that list when I, I moved here 20 years ago. So we have a great session for you today with three presenters who are going to speak for about 15 minutes each. Uh, they are Aaron Ackerley. Uh, we have got Carol O'Reilly and we've got Des Friedman. So Aaron Ackerley, I'm just going to do all the introductions now and then have the speakers go ahead. So Aaron Ackerley is a historian of modern Britain at the University of Sheffield. And his research explores the relationship between knowledge and power, particularly the intersections between popular and elite political cultures and the media. And for those of you who are interested in getting a copy of Capitalism's Conscience, I think you're going to find his, his chapter particularly useful in centering the political economy of some of the discussions we're having at this conference. Next up, we have Carol O'Reilly, uh, who is a senior lecturer in media and cultural studies at the University of Salford and the author of the 2019 book, The Greening of the City, Urban Parks and Public Le Leisure between 1840 and 1939. And she also has a journal article, which I particularly recommend that you read as a follow up to, to this talk, if you're able to access it. Um, that article appears in Northern History and is on the magnetic pull of the metropolis, the Manchester Guardian, the provincial press and the ideas of the North. And then we're going to close out the session with Des Friedman, who is a professor of media and communications here at Goldsmiths University of London. Des is the author of several books, including The Contradictions of Media Power, uh, another book called The Media Manifesto with Natalie Fenton and other editors. Uh, and he's also the founding member, a founding member of the Media Reform Coalition. Des is also the editor of the book that will be very relevant for those of you attending this conference and which I've mentioned already, Capitalism's Conscience, 200 Years of the Guardian, which has just been published by Pluto Press. Uh, so before I ask the presenters to begin, as I said, 15 minutes each, and then we're hoping for about 30 minutes of questions. Uh, you can, as with all of the other sessions that we had from yesterday and also this morning, put questions in the chat as we go along. And we've got some really fantastic colleagues who are helping us to gather those questions up and put them in the spreadsheet. So hopefully I will be able to group them together and get a really energized conversation going at the end of the presentations. An energized conversation, but also please a respectful conversation. Um, we've got different perspectives being aired here, and I suspect they're going to sound a little bit different from the opening session, uh, which is the bit that I'm looking forward to the most. So without further ado, Erin, uh, would you like to start? Thank you very much. Everyone, Aaron Ackerley. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Can you share my PowerPoint with you there. Hopefully you can all see that now. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about the Manchester Guardian's coverage of domestic, social and economic affairs in the interwar period. And this is necessarily going to be a broad brush account, uh, although it's one that's going to be peppered with illustrative evidence. The paper utilises uh, the John Ryland's archive to help look behind the scenes to help make sense of The Guardian's editorial stance and its published output. The interwar years were a time of great political and econ economic turbulence, both at home and abroad. 
And there's going to be some great papers lined up later today on The Guardian's relationship to Empire from Kathy Davis and Alexander Zevin. And I'm really looking forward to watching both of those. Imperial matters were also of great domestic concern in interwar Britain, especially due to the ongoing free trade versus protectionism struggle. The Guardian remained a bastion of free trade throughout the interwar years, as it was a key element in the conception of liberalism held by those at the top of the paper. A central focus of this conference is the Guardian's historic relationship to both liberalism and left-wing politics. And Gary Young's keynote speech last night gave a brilliant account of these dynamics for the current moment. The interwar period also serves as an interesting case study to explore such issues. In particular, I will focus on Ted Scott, son of the Guardian's most famous editor, C.P. Scott. Ted's influence over the paper in the first half of the interwar period has been overlooked, likely due to his tragic death in a boating accident in April 1932, less than three years after he had officially taken over the editorship from his father. Ted was also an extremely candid, uh, extremely candid in his personal correspondence, providing fascinating snapshots of his uncertainties about his own political beliefs and about how to steer the paper's editorial line. To fully make sense of the Manchester Guardian in the interwar period, however, we need to look back. Before the First World War, Victor Victorian orthodoxy such as small state laissez-faire capitalism, free trade, and a sound currency backed by the gold standard continued to hold sway in Britain. Challenges to orthodoxy had begun to gain ground by the Edwardian period, however. The foundation and rapid growth of the Labour Party, promoting social democratic policies, was one major rupture. Conservative and liberal unionist efforts to introduce protectionist policies, led by Joseph Chamberlain, was another. And Chamberlain, it's worth noting, had been a radical liberal. The Liberal Party itself was also home to new ideas, with the rise of the new liberalism in the 1890s. As the historian Peter Clark has documented, the Manchester Guardian played an important role in popularising new liberal ideas. Under C.P. Scott's editorship, leading new liberal theorists L.T. Hobhouse and J.A. Hobson used the paper as a platform to formulate and disseminate their ideas. The main difference between the new and the classical liberalism concerned how to best promote liberty. So classical liberalism posited that as long as government constraints were removed from individuals, they would be free. New liberals recognised that people could still be inhibited from achieving what they wanted to do and realising their potential due to circumstances beyond their control, such as poverty. New liberals accepted that taxation and expenditure could become positive instruments of social policy. 1909 saw the Chancellor of the Exchequer, David Lloyd George, introduce what was called the People's Budget which raised taxes and implemented a national insurance scheme, often depicted as the start of Britain's national welfare state. The onset of the First World War brought major social and economic change. To aid the war effort, some forms of economic planning were introduced, tariffs were utilised and Britain abandoned the gold standard. The war also accelerated Britain's relative economic decline and Britain's staple industries never truly recovered. The interwar period was racked with political and economic turmoil. The Liberal Party collapsed, Labour assumed office for the first time, and there was a sustained period of Conservative dominance. Structural unemployment running into the millions afflicted Britain from the early 1920s, and there was a second abandonment of the gold standard, then the Wall Street crash, the European financial crisis of 1931, and the subsequent formation of the Conservative-dominated national government and introduction of imperial preference and Liberals had to adapt to these events. Ted Scott played an important role in shaping the Guardian's response. Unlike his father, Ted had eschewed the traditional route of classics at Oxford and had instead studied economics at LSE. And during his time as a student, Ted had lived with J.A. Hobson and soon after, afterwards married his daughter, Mabel. And Ted put his training to good use as by the mid-1920s, he was the main leader writer on economic and social issues at The Guardian. The Guild Socialist S.G. Hobson lamented that 
uh, Ted's LSE education narrowed his vision. Yet Ted demonstrated an interest in Hobson's building guild and often appeared at their private meetings. In 1929, Ted joked to fellow LSE graduate uh, Marion Phillips, I thought from the last time we met that you had utterly abandoned me as a capitalistic sinner. Amid the turmoil of 1931, however, Ted told his friend on the staff of The Guardian, J.L. Hammond, that he was getting more and more into a socialist way of thinking, or rather feeling. Hammond, who was a Fabian, was one of the subjects of Peter Clark's survey of early 20th century intellectuals who were both liberals and social democrats. Ted increasingly supported socialist policies while noting that he liked the Labour Party leadership less and less. Nevertheless, Ted's support for radical policies followed the lead of his mentor, J.A. Hobson. Hobson, Hammond, and many fellow new liberals increasingly saw the Labour Party as a vehicle to achieve their aims, especially given the Liberal Party travailed. The Guardian's shift towards supporting more radical ideas in the period leading up to 1931 is showcased in its reporters' diaries, wherein each reporter listed their daily engagements. Contact details for key sources were often listed in the opening pages, such as for J.R. Clines, the Labour MP who became party leader in 1921. Clines was a staple in the Guardian's news columns in the early interwar period, with plenty of space devoted to his arguments. He was also regularly praised in the editorial column, with The Guardian supporting his call for action on unemployment. Undoubtedly, their view that Clines was a moderate Labour figure, as well as his support for free trade and the League of Nations, played an important role in the support. Clines featured heavily in the reporter's diaries for many years, symptomatic of the paper's growing sympathy for the Labour movement. Similarly, the Guild Socialist S.G. Hobson's contact details were listed and he was often visited by reporters when talking about unemployment. E.D. Simon, a prominent liberal politician who championed interventionist, interventionist liberalism, was also ever present in the reporters' diaries, at least up until the early 1930s. Simon was also integral to the Liberal Summer Schools, an influential Liberal Party forum that produced documents that promoted radical interventionist policies, such as the Yellow Book of 1928, and the Orange Book of 1929. And the idea of the Liberal Summer Schools actually materialised in 1920 at a gathering that included Ted and Mabel Scott and Simon and his wife. Members of The Guardian's editorial team often attended as both participants and speakers. The reporting staff frequently provided coverage in news articles and its deliberations provided regular material for the leader column. Further underlining the paper's leftward trajectory was the Guardian's city editor from 1929, Cecil Sprigg. Throughout the um, interwar years, most city editors held rigidly orthodox financial views, believing in the gold standard and a balanced budget, policies that served to stymie state intervention. Sprigg, meanwhile, was surely one of the only city editors to have written a biography about Karl Marx not to mention a sympathetic one. And Sprigg was also keen to develop links between liberals and social democrats. He therefore became a member of the XYZ Club from its founding in 1931, an informal policy group which aimed to bring together Labour members and sympathisers within the city of London. The club was to count many prominent Labour figures among its members, such as Hugh Gateskill, Harold Wilson, uh, and many others, as well as a range of city figures, though most of the latter group kept their presence secret. The XYZ Club has been mentioned in a number of histories, but the role of Sprigg, and hence The Guardian, has been overlooked. Assessing the club's impact is difficult, although Francis Williams later claimed that the club drew up a blueprint for Labour financial policy that was adopted by the Attlee government. He argued that it had, some claim to have exercised in a quiet sort of way more influence on future government policy than any other group of the time and to have done so in the most private manner without attracting publicity to itself. And in, and in keeping with this low profile strategy, the club received no mention in the pages of The Guardian while its city editor was involved. Francis Williams, who had been city editor of the Labour supporting Daily Herald, 
described a Treasury briefing in 1931. He and Sprigg were the sole voices who questioned the necessity of remaining on gold. He recalled the response. On the rest of the serious men around the table, it produced an effect of frozen horror. Sir Warren Fisher was particularly shaken. He found it impossible to remain seated. To suggest that we should leave the gold standard, he declared, is an affront not only to the national honour, but to the personal honour of every man and woman in the country. There was nothing for Sprigg and me to do but slink away. Support for abandoning orthodoxy was evident among others at The Guardian as well. As the renowned author Howard Sprigg recalled from his time there as a reporter, a lot most of us knew or cared about the gold standard. A lot it meant to us whether England was on it or off it. What we saw was too many people off the food standard and the clothing standard and the work standard and nothing was being done about it. However, some individuals that the um, Guardian consulted remained wedded to orthodoxy. Ted's education meant that he was well connected with academic economists. The Guardian recruited economists who were prominent in liberal circles and those based at the Victoria University of Manchester and LSE to write guest articles. This included voices offering radical solutions, most notably John Maynard Keynes, but also economists such as T.E. Gregory, T.S. Ashton, Lionel Robbins and Edwin Canaan, who stuck rigidly to classical liberal orthodoxy. Canaan had been one of Ted's tutors at LSE, and although he often wrote guest articles for The Guardian, he was aghast at the paper's editorial line and its promotion of theorists such as J. Hobson and Keynes. Writing to Ted in January 1930, he bemoaned, I am rather shocked that your formal, formerly respectable newspaper is descending under the management of a new generation to coquetting with J. A. Hobson's monomania. Despite backing radical policies and despite his economics education, however, Ted was racked with doubt. He confided to Lionel Robbins, I have not even tried to read Keynes, so, Keynes, so do not pretend to understand, even while at the same moment the Guardian was championing Keynes, Keynes's policies. Even on the issue of free trade, Ted seemed more emotionally rather than intellectually invested, telling Robbins, I still fall back in the main on the political, moral and international objections to protection, though I accept the economic ones. Following the formation of the national government in 1931, Ted increasingly, increasingly set the Guardian against it. He and others at the paper were critical of the large cuts to state spending, which they saw as compounding Britain's economic problems and mass unemployment. They continued to champion policies for industrial reorganisation and productive efficiency and to condemn the introduction of protectionism. Ted was aware that the, readers, uh, that the paper's increasingly strident critiques of the government could alienate readers, and this fear led Ted to question whether a change of cover price might be necessary from two penny down to one penny. With politics being in such an ugly shape, he believed that the Guardian would be driven more and more to take an anti-property line, and that is fatal to a two penny paper. Ted thought that sitting on or appearing to sit on the fence was unconscionable. This left The Guardian with no choice but to side more and more with moderate Labour supporters and Labour MPs who had not joined the national government. Yet The Guardian's leftward march was suddenly halted by Ted's death in April 1932. W. Peep Crozier was chosen as the new editor, being seen as a safe pair of hands. He was supportive of the national government, uh, in contrary to Ted. The change in the Guardian's stance under Crozier was exemplified by the paper's relationship with E.D. Simon, who had been close to C.P. and served as a director on the paper's board after his friend's death. Simon's relationship with Crozier was much cooler. Indeed, Simon was forced to relinquish his director role in 1938, as his frequent comments on the paper's contents embarrassed the editor. Although under Crozier the paper maintained a distance from Labour it, in its editorial line, it did still continue to provide space for Labour and radical liberal ideas. Of course, two liberal politicians, uh, Keynes and William Beveridge, provided much of the framework for the post-war Labour reforms, which The Guardian supported. Yet The Guardian remained wary of committing too strongly to radicalism or the Labour Party, even after Crozier was replaced by A.P. Wadsworth. A. P. Wadsworth. 
1947, the paper began to join a chorus of press criticism of the Attlee government, and it even reluctantly urged readers to vote Conservative in 1951. An editorial was keen to defend the paper from accusations that it betrayed the progressive cause, um, but it's up to, to you to decide if that had any merit, I guess. While impossible to know, it is interesting, I think, to muse whether the paper might have taken a different course had Ted remained alive. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, before we move on to Carol's presentation, I did just want to point out that we are recording this session. So the good news is we are recording this session and the bad news is that we are recording this session. So if you don't wish to be recorded, do bear that in mind for the Q&A. Okay, Carol, over to you. Thank you. I shall just share my PowerPoint. <clears throat> Okay, I'm struggling a little here. Can everybody see that? No, we can't no. see. Okay. Um, I'm not sure what what has gone a little bit differently this time. Have you clicked a different folder this time? No. OK, maybe I'll just close it and see if that makes any difference. Sorry about this. Not at all. I think my most memorable words for the past 14 to 15 months are, can you see my screen? <laughs> just um. so stressful. It's very stressful. OK. Yes. You, well, you were there. Yeah, it was. Yes. It was working earlier. Yeah, no, you just you just brought up your screen. Oh, did I? Oh, yes. OK, sorry. OK. Right. Perfect. Right, we have it. Okay. OK, great. Yeah, so. OK. Wonderful. Away we go. <clears throat> Away we go. Um, good morning, everybody. As Clea said, my paper has actually already been published in Northern History under a slightly different title. I wanted to tweak it just a little bit before I presented it to you. Um, but essentially, like Aaron, my research led me to the Manchester Guardian archives at the John Rylands Special Collections in Manchester. And classically, in terms of archival research, I was looking for one thing and ended up finding something else. So this paper is based around my examination of uh, the reactions of readers of the newspaper in the context of the decision to remove the word Manchester from the title of the paper. And this happened in 1959. Hiding in that archive, I found a portfolio of 251 letters that had been written to the paper after it had announced the name change. <clears throat> Just for a little bit of uh, context. This at the time was the Manchester Guardian building in Manchester on Cross Street, um, a very iconic building of the time. But it's true to say that by the middle of the 1950s, the Manchester Guardian was going through something of an identity crisis. Um, partly this was fueled by questions about whether or not it was really a national newspaper as the management of the paper believed it to be or whether, as far as the British newspaper industry was concerned, it was really a provincial paper. So it was kind of trying to inhabit two worlds, and these two worlds were more and more um, uh, opposing each other. The other thing that was a factor here was the readership of the paper. By the mid-50s, uh, readership levels in Manchester and the Northwest more generally were pretty static. But what was interesting to the management of the paper was that readership in London, the Southeast and the home counties was growing. So this was a sense that, again, people were starting to ask questions about the identity of the paper. Where, where did the paper belong? And the first kind of attempt to address this was an announcement to change the name. At this time, there were two men who were really driving the paper forward. One was Lawrence Scott, who was the uh, managing editor, and he was a grandson of C.P. Scott. And this man here, who is Alistair Hetherington, who was the editor of the paper. He was appointed in 1956. 
And both Hetherington and Scott were determined to confront what they saw as serious opposition to the Manchester Guardian status as a truly national paper. So they were really pretty determined to reposition the paper, to rebrand it, if you like, as a truly national paper. And um, one of their first steps in August of 1959 was to announce that the title of the newspaper would change from the Manchester Guardian to the Guardian. While not involving the paper's physical move away from Manchester, this decision actually began a debate about the status and the role of the Guardian and of its relationship with Manchester that was to last well into the 1970s. When the paper announced the, this decision, they defended it in one of their editorials, saying, quote, the omission of Manchester implies no change in policy and we hope no disrespect to our home. <clears throat> Nonetheless, it remained the case that two thirds of the paper's circulation was now coming from outside of the Northwest, and much of that circulation was based in the Southeast, essentially. Having announced the change of name, letters flooded into the paper. This appears to have taken the paper's management somewhat by surprise. It doesn't really seem as if they were anticipating the readership to react in quite the way that it did. But nonetheless, people wrote for the most part to express their shock and amazement um, at this decision. These letters are really interesting in any number of ways, not just for what they tell us about the readers and their relationship to the Manchester Guardian, but also more generally about how readers express and articulate their relationship to a newspaper. Um, and getting access to this is actually relatively rare when you spend a lot of time researching the history of newspapers. One of the things that you very often don't know is what the paper means to the readers. So I think these letters are really very valuable then because of the way in which the readers articulate and describe what the paper actually means to them. The letters came from all over the world. That's the other astonishing thing about them. They were not all coming from British readers. They came from expat readers. They came from New York, Paris, Ghana. Most of the letters, as you might expect, were critical about the decision of the name change. In fact, the roughly four to one against the, cha the change of name. They seem to have come from all kinds of people, as far as one can tell. A lot of the letters are written on quite posh monogrammed note paper with the person's address on it. Others are just on random scraps of paper that appear to be torn off. So they do seem to be reasonably diverse. <clears throat> In terms of gender, four times as many men wrote as women where we could determine gender. But the bulk of the mail came from within the UK. <clears throat> While most readers' reactions to the name change was negative, the ways in which they actually described their feelings varied enormously. And this is also something that I found quite interesting. <clears throat> On its first day as The Guardian, as opposed to The Manchester Guardian, one reader wrote, he cared not a fig for what you choose to call the paper. I will call it The Manchester Guardian until I die. So quite a dramatic reaction. Others accuse the paper of being ashamed of Manchester, being ashamed of its provincial origins, of viewing Manchester as an encumbrance, as a liability. They accuse the paper of snobbery about its uniqueness, failure to take pride in the idea of being provincial. Other readers drew direct parallels between the word Manchester and particular aspects of the city and the newspaper's character. Edward Horgan of Fallowfield in Manchester pointed out that whilst this city is progressively becoming a second capital of England, you have the effrontery to disown the city by cutting it. The conflation of Manchester with ideas of liberalism was used often by readers to draw out the similarities between the disposition of the paper and the city of its birth. Sidney Solomon of Richmond, London wrote that Manchester is something more than the name of a great city. Doris Phillips from Gloucestershire equated the newspaper directly with the character of the city. Its whole onerous, rigorous personality surely belongs to Manchester at its best. GP Webb of Leicester suggested that the Guardian owes its existence and its character to Manchester. It is unbecoming, you seem to think, to proclaim its association with a provincial city. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> Elsie Entwistle, who is a Mancunian based in London, emphasised the importance of the Manchester Guardian in uniting those who were displaced from the city. How are we to now establish kinship, she asked, in the overcrowded trains of the metropolis? How are we to gain a smile of recognition from the deadpan faces in the congested underground? <clears throat> Michael Powick listed the traits that he associated with Manchester, freedom, criticism, eclectic tolerance in the arts, etc. In a word, liberalism. The use of the term Manchester reminds the world that England is not yet London. Some readers sensed an attempt at populism in the management's decision. They argued that attempts were being made to make the paper more popular, which they clearly disapproved, and to aspire to compete with the times. <clears throat> Manchester, therefore, to many of the readers, represented anything but London. It signified ideals about belonging and the role of the newspaper in shaping and defining what Michael Borer has termed a community of believers. The apparent lack of popularity of The Guardian drew its readers together into a sense of community based not on commercial success, but on actual quality of content. The relationship to the local area and to the city of Manchester then was clearly important to the readers of the Manchester Guardian. Their tendency to conflate Manchester with the North more generally also established a strong association between the city and the region in the readers' minds. One reader suggested it would have been much better if the change had been made out of faith in a great newspaper rather than contempt for a great city. Other readers perceived the localism of the newspaper's title and character more broadly in terms of the north of England and the characteristics of northernness rather than the city of Manchester. Stanley Price from York observed that the Manchester Guardian also had that touch of intimacy and ironic humour which is deeply ingrained in the northern character. Anne Isaac of Bristol described the Manchester Guardian as a daily whiff of the vigorous and bracing intellectual climate of the North. <clears throat> the fact of the North's distance from London gave it a unique perspective that was lacking in the capital. Manchester's status as not London was connected to the value of the city as an idea, as a rep representation of independence and distinctiveness. And it was this that was valued by many of the readers. The editorial's response to many of these letters was a little bit hesitant and defensive. The Guardian returned to this in the 31st of August, a couple of days after the name change had been announced, writing, we are not being swallowed by London's centralizing appetite. London is not a heart sending lifeblood through the nation's veins. Our home remains in Manchester. We have no intention of deserting the North. So they're really struggling to kind of make the argument. This repetition of our home and the deliberate equation of Manchester with the North is a clear attempt to dispel people's fears that the, player, that the paper planned a formal move uh, to London. <clears throat> the loss of the local Manchester identity of the paper was emphasized by many readers. For one reader, the inclusion of Manchester in the title meant that the paper was not part of the Fleet Street horde and did not go with the crowd. Another suggested that the views of The Guardian were uncontaminated by London spokesmen or Fleet Street predilections. Many of the readers indeed wrote of the fact that they had no connection whatever with the city. Peter Butcher of Cumran wrote, I have never been nor have I any desire to go to Manchester. Elsie Davis of Frodsham and Cheshire argued that it has been one of the small pleasures of my life to ask for a Manchester Guardian in an ostentatious way at a bookstall in the South. This evidence emphasises that the inhabitants of the same place can disagree profoundly about the character of that place and of its people, and that the idea of consensus about what a place and a newspaper mean to its readers can be articulated quite differently. Not every reader was negative about about the change, however. Some readers who responded more positively to the change took the opportunity to complain about their regular frustrations associated with The Guardian during this period, constant late delivery, preponderance of poor sub-editing. One reader actually managed to generate a positive from this, writing that I value the misprints just as a sign of the independence from the South. They're a symbolic guarantee that the paper speaks for another section of England. Again, it's not London. <clears throat> Some readers sensed the commercial imperatives behind the decision. Duncan Macaulay of Sale in Manchester wrote that you were obviously out to catch more of the top people. 
not an attitude that endeared the paper to so many in the past. <clears throat> Another writer from Liverpool felt that readers are now relegated to the realm of readers of ordinary morning papers without any indication how or from whence we came. <clears throat> Some readers acknowledged that there was actually nothing wrong with a commercial imperative. There's nothing wrong with aiming at an increased circulation, wrote Stanley Rubin. The more you can influence public opinion, the better. Another acknowledged that a newspaper to be of any use must survive. The whole problem with the move to London and the attraction of London is summarised very well by the Manchester surgeon, Sir Harry Pratt. He wrote that the magnetic pull of the metropolis with its corridors of power is irresistible. Nonetheless, the decision had been made. The Manchester Guardian became the Guardian and the readers just had to accept it, had to live with it, and indeed they did. The paper did not suffer any great loss of readership in Manchester or in the Northwest more generally as a result of this decision. As I said at the outset, this began a whole uh, long period of um, the paper gradually moving to London. London printing started in 1961. In the mid-60s, some of the staff started to move away from Manchester and down to London. The full paper engages with the Anthony Cohen's idea of the symbolic construction of community and tries to apply this to the reader's reactions. For many readers, the name change was an opportunity for them to demonstrate their sense as part of this community of Manchester Guardian readers and what this really, really meant to them. This was not universally articulated in quite the same way by these readers, as we've seen, but it did have some common elements that kept coming up again and again. The sense of Manchester and the North more generally, both as a place, a physical place, and as an idea, as a symbol of something, and the unifying theme of liberalism with which Manchester, and particularly the Manchester Guardian, had been strongly associated. Just before I finish, I'd like to mention um, one particular element of how London saw Manchester. We've talked quite a lot about how Manchester saw London. But once The Guardian in 1961 made the decision to print all of its editions in London, um, two publications, the National News Agent uh, published a cartoon about The Guardian moving to London and again perpetuated a very familiar stereotype about the bad weather of the north, the bad weather of Manchester, but almost exactly the same cartoon and the same theme was produced in Punch, also in 1961, where again, The Guardian um, comes along with bad weather and with rain, I guess very little changes. <clears throat> so um, the symbolic significance of the Manchester Guardian was much more significant, I think, to its readers than the actual literal content of the paper. What it represented was more than what it said. And this symbolism was clearly derived from their reading of the text. The readers of the paper placed much more value on their symbolic attachment to the ideas of what the newspaper represented. If you would like to read the full published paper, that is the actual link to it there. Those are the details that you need. For any of you who don't have access to Northern History, please do just get in touch with me and I would be extremely happy to share it with you. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Carol. As I read your paper and listened to your presentation, I kept thinking this this ought to be verbatim theatre. It's just so wonderful and rich. I have got to hear someone asking in an ostentatious voice. Yeah. <laughs> Manchester Guardian. Yeah. Fantastic. So thank you very much. We're now moving on to a third and final speaker for this session. That's Des Friedman, after which we'll open up to Q&A. But do put your questions in the chat as well. Des, over to you. Thank you so much, Clea. Um, well, I'm the token southerner, um, but I want to return to Manchester because for the current editor, Catherine Viner uh, of The Guardian, in her words, the history of The Guardian begins on the 16th of August, 1819. And that's a date when you will have heard Alan Rusbridge talk about in his keynote this morning, when around 50,000 people attended a mass rally in St. Peter's Fields in Manchester to press for electoral reform and trade union rights and were met with a brutal assault by local yeomanry that led to the deaths of uh, some 18 people and widespread outrage against the authorities. We know, and Alan talked about this, that in the crowd that day was John Edward Taylor, a cotton merchant and a part-time journalist, who wrote up his account um, of the massacre for the Times, helping to make what might have been contained as a local event into a national sensation. And according to Viner, 
uh, quote, Taylor exposed the facts, something very important for, in, in Alan's talk this morning, Taylor exposed the facts without hysteria. By reporting what he had witnessed, he told the stories of the powerless and he held the powerful to account. And the events at Peterloo motivated Taylor in the official Guardian narrative um, to start his own paper two years later, the Manchester Guardian, um, that in Viner's words were committed to, quote, enlightenment values, liberty, reform and justice. So I want to spend my time um, in this talk outlining just some of the contradictions that I see that are associated with the birth of the Manchester Guardian and to conclude that these contradictions reflect the liberalism with which the Guardian is intimately associated. So three things. First of all, that um, Edwards used Peterloo to promote a constitutionalist alternative to the left and attach blame both to the authorities and to the radical leaders for the events of the day. Second, that the Guardian arrived not at the heights of a political upturn, but actually at the start of a short period of social stability with which uh, it sought to maintain. Um, third, the Guardian contributed to the, to the demise of the main radical newspaper in Manchester at the time. And crucially for me, it sought alliances not with a nascent working class movement, but with liberal business interests that were concentrated in the cotton industry and pursued an editorial agenda that reflected precisely these interests. So um, let's start again with, with Peterloo um, and the context around it. Um, the second decade of the 19th century was... I think you know, many historians agree, an insurrectionary period in England, as in many other parts of the world. With the French Revolution of recent memory and with basic democratic rights to vote and to organise denied to the vast majority of the population in England and beyond, there was a very rebellious mood amongst uh, the, uh, a growing working class movement, um, characterised by the smashing up of machinery, by huge radical meetings, hunger marches, food riot riots and so on. Up to 1819, as E.P. Thompson has argued, middle class reformers were not yet strong enough to offer a moderate line of advance. It was the radicals that were really making the running. But the horrific events at Peterloo changed this and it transformed the balance of forces amongst the proponents of reform. Taylor, the founder of the Manchester Guardian, was outraged by the violence meted out against ordinary protesters, but he was equally enraged by the rhetoric of what he called the plebeian aristocracy. And Taylor refused to lay responsibility for Peterloo, you know, simply at the door of the state, insisting in his words, and he wrote, you know, he wrote a really good fact-driven account, which really did, you know, um, challenge the official narratives, but in that same document, he wrote this, that the yeomanry, quote, are incapable of acting with deliberate cruelty and blamed instead a handful of wayward individuals amongst them, quote, whose political rancor approaches to absolute insanity. In other words, it was a few mad, bad apples. The key lesson for Taylor wasn't that Peterloo demonstrated the need for thoroughgoing political change and the extension of democracy to the poor. It demonstrated instead the need to build social harmony and to restore faith in the law, a law that had just permitted the slaughter of more than a dozen citizens. There will be no peace, he argued, until, quote, the poor have regained that perfect confidence in the impartiality of the law, the impartiality of the law. Peterloo exposed the barbarism of the authorities to a national audience, and it opened the door to liberal reformers to make a case for piecemeal change, and thus to preempt the need to cave in to radical demands for universal suffrage and beyond. Indeed, while the constitutionalist wing of the movement gained in confidence following Peterloo, the so-called revolutionary wing, facing sustained repression and internal division, actually lost its momentum after Peterloo. According to Thompson, once again, uh, quote, uh, once the clamour of 1819 had died down, the middle class reform movement assumed a more determined aspect. And actually, we see that the industrial militancy that had characterised that whole decade leading up to Peterloo died down, albeit only for a few years, it has to be said. But what happened immediately after Peterloo is it kind of opened a space. It paved the way for liberal minded business leaders to agitate for parliamentary reform, to agitate for religious freedom and above all, to mobilise for free trade. People like Taylor his good friend and fellow journalist Archibald Prentice and a group of others 
were part of what was known as the, quote, little circle, a group of Manchester merchants that opposed both the rule of the old order that they saw as kind of barbaric but, but backwards, but they also opposed the extension of the franchise to all working people. At least they certainly did not throw themselves into those mobilizations of the extension of the franchise. And Peter Lou played a key role in the development of the little circle, convincing its members of the need for a new constitutionally focused political strategy that was distinct from that of the radicals. One contemporary historian, David Knott, argues that while circle members were outraged by the violence they witnessed at Peterloo, in his words, they also wanted to distance themselves from the event. They wanted to channel radical political dissent into things like, quote, deliberative assemblies that took the form of, again, this is a quote, rational debate within legally sanctioned indoor local political forums. Indoor local political forums. They didn't want people out on the streets. That's a messy and dangerous business. Um, but what the, the, the little circle of Manchester merchants lacked at the time was a vehicle that could articulate their values and promote these assemblies, something like a regular newspaper. But actually, it was the fallout from Peterloo that provided precisely this opportunity. That was the context for the emergence of the Manchester Guardian, which was born not, I would argue, in an industrial and political upturn powered by a mass movement, let alone in the flowering of radical journalism, but as E.P. Thompson describes the period, in a quote, mildly prosperous plateau of social peace. So let's return now, about halfway through, right, good. Um, turn now to, to the, the founding of the, of the title itself. It's important to note that the first instincts of the members of the circle weren't to set up their own newspaper, but actually to buy out another liberal newspaper, the Manchester Gazette. Uh, this wasn't successful for a number of reasons, and it was only then that Taylor secured the necessary capital from his friends in the Manchester business community to launch the newspaper. And the first thing he did, not surprisingly, was to produce a prospectus. It's what you do when you want to start a newspaper. Um, designed to publicise its imminent arrival and more significantly to, to secure advertising. Catherine Viner, the Guardian's editor today, describes this document as a, quote, powerful document, one whose ideals still shape the Guardian. It's a celebration of more people getting educated, of more people engaging in politics from different walks of life, from poorer communities. But actually, well, that's not my reading of the prospectus. I think it's quite cautious in its political orientation. It fails to mention Peterloo. It fails to mention the government's repression at the time. Instead, what it does is prom promise that the newspaper will be committed to, quote, the promotion of public happiness and the security of popular rights. It promises to warmly advocate the cause of reform without being tied to any political, a specific political party. In fact, the prospectus makes it clear that the Manchester Guardian is aimed at, quote, the classes to whom advertisements are generally addressed. It notes that no other Manchester newspaper was fully committed to represent, quote, the wealth and intelligence of this town. And the prospectus promised that the newspaper will provide comprehensive information about commerce and about the cotton trade above all. And it's an uncomfortable and unavoidable reality for The Guardian and for all of us that the capital required for its startup came largely from an industry whose own wealth was intimately bound up with the profits accrued from the slave trade. And the prospectus clearly illustrates that the title was designed to be the house organ of cotton interests, that some of those involved in the paper's founding were active abolitionists, does little to change the structural dependence of the title on a source of wealth that directly contradicts its own liberal values, or perhaps more accurately, that reflects the fundamentally compromised history of uh, liberalism itself. Coming back to uh, the prospectus, um, uh, far from praising it for its radicalism, as Viner does, Archibald Prentice, who was Taylor's great friend at the time, he actually later criticised its caution. He wrote, his book was written a, a couple of decades later. He really criticised the caution and suggested that despite the wish of some of its backers for a more vigorous embrace of reform, according to Prentice, it was felt that it was better not to make a broad declaration of political opinions, which would give offence to the classes having advertisements to bestow. In other words, the prospectus wasn't a sign of uh, radical intent, but an expression of the commercial interest and liberalism of its founders. And actually, Taylor himself um, was an unreliable progressive voice. One moment he was attacking police spies and government corruption in the paper, but then he was supporting Tory proposals soon after the paper's launch. 
to restrict poor relief, which perhaps reflected his own Malthusian beliefs and population control. And in fact, one of the most immediate impacts of the, car, of the Manchester Guardian in its first month was to squeeze the life out of the Observer, the Manchester Observer, which was a top selling title of the left and an organizer of the Peterloo protest. Um, the, the Observer didn't lack readers, but its support for the more militant wing of the reform movement, together with its inability to attract advertising, meant that it was politically and financially vulner vulnerable. And actually, the, as soon as The Guardian appeared, there was more pressure on The Observer, and it didn't even last a month before it disappeared. The Guardian did enjoy modest success to, to start with, but with a weakened uh, Gazette and a no, then non-existent -obser Observer on the reform side, the title started to pick up circulation and, and ads, and Ta Taylor was soon able to pay off his partners after three years. What did he do with this? Did he hand it to the leaders of Peterloo? Well, actually, he used the capital to acquire in 1825, and those four years after it started, um, to acquire two conservative supporting Manchester papers, the Mercury and the British Volunteer, thus extending the impact of The Guardian amongst Tory readers. This was precisely what Taylor wanted, as according to the historian Robert Poole, he moved, quote, confidently amongst the Tory-dominated circles of the Chamber of Commerce and the Exchange, the Manchester Exchange, and formed common political cause with the economic liberals among them, with Taylor, according to Paul, actually claiming credit for reforming the Manchester yeah. Tory party. So that's one of the great achievements in the first five years, it was not that it got the, the, the lead, you know, the organizers of Peter Lou out of jail, but actually it reformed the Manchester Tory party. This shift to the right had already infuriated some of the original backers of the Manchester Guardian, leading a deeply frustrated Prentice to conclude that the newspaper was by 1823, two years after its um, uh, uh, launch, that it was, quote, the guardian of the commercial interests of the town and neighbourhood, a reputation much more valuable in a pecuniary point of view than the fame of being the advocate of popular rights. Rather than committing itself to pressing for working class rights and universal suffrage, the Guardian adopted a relatively cautious and passive perspective in relation to radical demands for reform. And Prentice himself describes this as a halfway position, quote, rather disposed to wait for the coming up of those who were in the rear, in other words, reform-minded conservatives, than to march forward and join those who were in the advance. So I've got one or two minutes left, I think, clear, if that's all right, just to conclude. For me, the story of the founding uh, of the Manchester Guardian reveals a highly ambiguous commitment to democratic principles and a refusal to embrace radical reform. Far from challenging the legitimacy of the institutions yeah. that were responsible for the Peterloo massacre, Taylor attributed the, vi the violence on that day to a few bad apples and campaigned for a public inquiry that might embarrass the government but not directly challenge its authority. Instead of, of, leading, the, instead of leading the campaign for universal suffrage and pressing for an extension of workers' rights, the Manchester Guardian infused the reform movement with a constitutionalist politics that diluted the more militant demands of a Labour movement that had, up until 1819, provided the dominant voice for social change. In doing this, I believe that it expressed the dynamics not of an incipient socialism, but of an emerging liberalism. The Manchester Guardian railed against police spies, it railed against corrupt officials, but it pursued reform on the basis that it would head off the most immediate threats posed by working class militants. It supported the repeal, which is one of the big issue of the day. It was supported the appeal of the Anti-Trade Union Combination Acts, not so much because they were an affront to the democratic right to organize, but because they risked inflaming workers. It opposed slavery, but it assessed its brutal logic, the brutal logic of slavery, most often from a free trade perspective, and failed to reflect critically on its own connections to the profits accrued from slave labor, something that is finally forced uh, been forced to do this uh, this year, and we can expect a report on that in the next few months. The Guardian was, above all, the voice of a modernizing wing of the Manchester business community that sought to establish dialogue with the powerful rather than to amplify um, the uh, rather than to amplify the, the the movements of the labouring pool. The Guardian's liberalism, just to finish, consistently outrages voices to its right, but more often than not, regularly enrages its critics on the left. Alexander Zevin has described The Economist in a great book as the lodestar of a certain type of laissez-faire liberalism. For me, The Guardian, on the other hand, can be seen as the harbinger of a more socially conscious form of liberalism, a liberalism that can pursue equality, celebrate diversity and extol emancipation, 
but that simultaneously defends the institutions that give rise to inequality, discrimination, militarism and imperialism. It's a liberty that's based on a commitment to liberty that, as my colleague Gollum Kibani puts it, quote, has provided an ideological bulwark against authoritarianism, but that has also always been connected to the configurations of the liberal democratic capitalist state. And that is why I believe, that's why I've described The Guardian as capitalism's conscience, wedded to reproducing the value system of the status quo and opposed to the values and beliefs of a socialist alternative. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Des. We've now heard from all three of our speakers, and hopefully those of you who are with us were able to hear all three. Um, I'm, I'm sure people are longing to have as much human connection as possible. So let's see how, how we go with our voice chat. And the best way, I think, to do that is to raise your hand, as Paloma has indicated, and we'll call on you. We'll see how many questions come through. Um, we'll take them one at a time for the time being, and, and if there are a whole lot, then we'll start grouping them together. So let me know by a show of hands. And I'm not seeing any hands yet, but the, I know how Teams is sometimes. You can, clear, clear, you can always yeah, pick, I, on, pick on your colleagues to ask a question, that would be. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Right, um, so I'm, I'm seeing lots of, uh, there's a couple of acknowledgements and we have got a question. So is it Aurelian? We need to unmute. Yes, go ahead. Are you speaking? There you go. Yeah, okay, I yeah. can, yeah. I can now speak we now. Can yeah, I, was, I was blocked. Please uh, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for the papers. Uh, it, it's fascinating because it's something that I know very little about actually, the history of, uh, of the Guardian and uh, and I, and I just love how it really echoes with, with what we're seeing today. Um, and so I, I was wondering, I mean, it's a very broad question here, but I was wondering if you could speak, uh, if all speakers really could speak to how how all of this kind of history and the relationship with liberalism and The Guardian really informs us with where The Guardian is going today and, and whether there's any hope of, of reforming The Guardian into something more radical or whether we should just totally give up on it. I mean, this is something that I'm grappling with and lots of people are grappling with as well uh, and obviously this book is is trying to kind of address in many ways so yeah it's a broad question but I was wondering whether you're you know whether you could kind of bring it to the to a present in a way um, and yeah have your thoughts on that okay that's great now who'd like to to answer first or Des we'll just start with you since you just finished right you just heard from me okay well like I mean I think we have to understand that the history of liberalism is something that both responds to pressures um, from social movements, that it, that, it, that it was born out of a desire for emancipation, but also was a profoundly contradictory movement that, that also sought, you know, that was based on the exclusions of certain groups from this understanding of emancipation, uh, if you're going back to enlightenment um, debates, and above all, that it sought to calm the waters, that it sought to provide a, uh, an approach to emancipation um, that would stabilize society as opposed to truly unleash the forces necessary for full human emancipation. That sounds a very grand way of talking about it, but I think we've heard some fantastic, yeah. um, you know, I thought, you know, Aaron, so many of Aaron's quotes really do actually help. To, to sort of um, express that in, in, in particular, you know, around the national government uh, yeah. and so on. So where does that leave us now? Well, I think it helps yeah. to explain what we see, what we read, what we browse online in terms of, um, uh, of Guardian coverage, that it is very um, uh, aware of injustices. So again, it's coverage of Windrush. You know, I imagine at both top levels and in the newsroom, they would have found yeah. the discrimination against the Windrush generation absolutely horrendous. Yeah. But does that mean that they are, and, and you know, Amelia Gentleman's coverage was really, really, not just fantastic, but, you know, impactful, important. But does that mean they are willing to um, generalise beyond this and take a stand about the power relations in the British state, which, you know, which were responsible for this? And again, I think that there are those limitations that it will not do this over a whole range of issues. Um, that actually, 
precisely it will reflect some of the popular discontent, but it will do so. I'm not just saying it's just a straightforward safety valve, but it will do so in such a way as it can incorporate it into what it constantly has described historically and still to this day um, as a moderate response. So I did, you know, um, I had hoped to do all these loads of tweets about Guardian coverage. And frankly, I, I, I had too many other important day job type things to do. But I looked at its coverage of protest. And for the last, you know, 200 years, literally, it um, ending up in its coverage of the Bristol protests against the latest um, uh, police bill, you know, it is offended by some of the things that the police may do, but it very often uncritically accepts the voice of authority to begin with. And it's only when it's pushed, it will then actually produce some really good articles, which is exactly what it did with Bristol. You know, to begin with, completely, you know, a, a reproduce, you know, printing pictures of some of the protesters. Um, but it was when it was pushed by people on the ground, it actually started to ask important questions. So that's a very negative response in terms of your the answer question uh, to, the, to the question, can we reform it in the way in which you want, Aurelia, is probably not because that's not its job. Its job and its history is not to be an emancipatory vehicle. It is to, to, to be a constitutionalist response to uh, the injustices that, that liberalism was a partial response to. OK, um, Aaron and Carol, would you want to to chip in your responses? Uh, shall we start? We're going backward then. So if we go to Carol and then end with Aaron and move on to Giora's question. Yeah, my facetious response is that it should move back to Manchester, of course. <laughs> Um, but I guess the considered response would be these days it really doesn't matter where you are, where you're based is kind of largely irrelevant. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's not a good thing. But the one thing that we've learned from all of the sessions in this conference so far is just how kind of schizophrenic The Guardian has been throughout its history in terms of its relationship, not just with liberalism, but with uh, its position on many things. So I don't think there's an easy answer these days. You know, making money in journalism is incredibly difficult. But if you don't make money, you don't survive. And there were some serious concerns about The Guardian's future a few years ago. It seems to have pulled itself back a little bit now, which is great. But I'd rather we had it for all of its faults than that we didn't have it. And Aaron? Uh, OK, so... This is kind of a big question and I'm going to try and expand on some of the things that Des and Carol just said as well. Um, just to echo Des's thoughts, liberalism has been a highly contested amorphous ideology and I think we can see that with The Guardian from the kind of high point of Cobdenism in the mid 19th century, small state free trade or liberalism, Free trade remaining as probably the most steadfast ideology that the Guardian would not budge from through the interwar period, even as it was losing popular support across the country. Um, whereas these days, I would say the Guardian free trade would not be uh, something that the Guardian positions its, itself as defending. In fact, it would critique uh, many of the unfair aspects of, of that regime. So liberalism can always be contested. And as Des says, their pressure and broader social and cultural debates and movements can definitely have an effect on a paper like The Guardian. As regards The Guardian always propping up the status quo when all things are said and done, I do think there is something to that. Um, but also, we should acknowledge the moments where The Guardian has taken a, a radical stand and I think in my paper, I was trying to show that um, while the, it was still doing this kind of establishment liberal thing of saying, yes, we'll work with those on the left, but only if they behave in, in the right way or aren't too extreme. Um, Ted was willing to, to back radical policy, policies that he thought might bankrupt the paper. And in that tradition, he was following C.P. Scott, his father, who had nearly bankrupted the paper in the Boer War, going against the prevailing imperialism of Britain at the time. And it wasn't just, uh, this imperialism wasn't just on the right, there were plenty of liberal imperialists. So it really was a, a very radical stance to take at that time. Um, so I, I do think The Guardian has intervened in radical ways. And if we think about it as um, not always the intent, but the end result, I think The Guardian 
acting as a fulcrum for these radical liberal policies and making connections in the interwar period actually had important progressive outcomes. Even if we may not always agree that they pushed it far enough, it was working alongside lots of other left-wing movements that may have been more extreme, but The Guardian was a, an important um, publication as well within this, this broader mass. Finally, I just want to stress the role of individuals here. So I think when it comes to newspapers, we always think we newspapers have a character, they have traditions, and we always think we kind of know where a newspaper stands. And that's kind of true. But individuals do matter. The fact that C.P. Scott became editor and a band, I would say, moved away from a lot of the stuff Des was talking about and actually embraced the new liberalism, it basically came down to his convictions and his social contacts. The same with Ted. He was willing as an individual to try and be more radical. Crozier, when he became editor, reined it back in because of, they were both liberals, but Crozier had a much more conservative view of liberalism. We, debates of the last few days, people saying they've noticed a change since Kath Viner has become editor compared to Alan Rusbridger. Um, Seamus Milne, when he was the, the comment editor, individuals in key positions at newspapers can make important changes and interventions to those newspapers. And just to touch on what Carol said, finally, then I'll, I'll stop going on. Um, the, the local aspect of The Guardian probably was much more important in the past than now. Uh, and I tried to touch on in my paper how local connections really influenced The Guardian's coverage from political elites in the region that was a hotbed of the new liberalism to people working at the local university to the, the reporters' diaries contain lots of instances where reporters were attending um, debating clubs, dining clubs, the Rotary International, and they were using that to get content for the newspaper. And lots of progressive ideas in these venues were being spread. So progressives trying to, to kind of make connections with journalists at places like The Guardian argue their case and get a platform. You may not be able to alter the editorial stance fully, but if you can get lots of articles being published there, I'd still say that's a, a, a good thing. Okay, thank you. And Giorio, uh, correct my pronunciation if, if necessary. It's Giorio. Giorio. Uh, th thanks very much for, for a, wonderful, uh, a wonderful session of newspaper history. Um, the two, two thoughts that came to mind, one of them, uh, particularly to Des and, and to Aaron, it's been uh, uh, running from yesterday, this kind of starting with the Michael Curtis, this disappointment with The Guardian that it isn't what people want it to be. But the newspaper has, in fact, declared what it is. It's a liberal newspaper and is, is not the real question with all the failings of, of liberalism which have been pointed out and rightly. And, well, isn't the real issue, why has there been no paper to the left of The Guardian, which holds social democratic values, for example, and can sustain itself as a, as a conveying uh, ideas on a mass basis? And I'm thinking going back to the Daily Herald as a particular example, or, or uh, Reynolds News was a Sunday newspaper with a radical outlook. And these newspapers have disappeared. And I think that the real question, and it also came up yesterday with the alternative media, is uh, there's as if a, a, an important section of British politics that don't have a, a, that don't have a, a, a mass news medium that represents them and trying to pull The Guardian to be that, but The Guardian doesn't exactly want to be that. He wants to be somewhere a little different on the political map. Uh, so that's a question, one question. The second thing that really intrigued me in, in Carol's talk was the relationship with the North. And, uh, and you had this wonderful editorial where The Guardian is saying, don't worry, we're never going to desert the North. And just to thinking about all the discussion in British politics in the last, certainly since the last election, not just in the sense of the Labour Party, but as if, you know, the metropolitan elite, just to take an unfair kind of characterization, and London leaving the, the North behind, also to do with Brexit. Was there state, did The Guardian continue trying to, to prove to its readers that it cares about the North? Does it continue doing this to this day because of its 
origins in the north? Then that's a question. Oh, great question. Can I come back on the first one? Yes, yes, OK. Um, disappointment. I mean, I, um, I think as I end my conclusions to the book with, disappointment for me is not enough. And it's a question of how you balance disappointment against anger in particular circumstances. Um, but, you know, you, you ask a very good question. Why isn't there a title of, uh, of the left? Well, The Guardian, as I tried to point out in, in my talk, was not innocent in the ecology of the Manchester news landscape. And actually, you know, it had a big impact in, in uh, kind of squeezing the life out of the Manchester Observer, no, no relation to the current Observer. This was a left-wing paper that was doing very well. But, and this is precisely where we need James Curran to give us the newspaper history. It's precisely what happened to the Chartist Press. There were left-wing titles. They were read and consumed by many, many hundreds of thousands of people. They were read out loud. They did not disappear because there wasn't an appetite for them. They disappeared because the business model squeezed the life out of them. And to a certain extent, in a way, the Manchester Guardian actually did that in terms of, of the left um, at that time. And all I would say is for all the moments, I mean, I just, I always, I do think about moments. Moments are important. There are some great moments. And as Aaron was saying about the Boer War, the, 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 the courageous reporting then, um, of the Boer War. But you look at other moments. The Corbyn moment was significant because it truly did, I think, have an impact. Quite rightly, as Gary Young said last night, you have to look probably within Labour to, yeah. to really um, think about why Corbynism didn't succeed more than The Guardian. But it doesn't mean The Guardian was not part of the discussion. When it comes back to, you know, uh, questions around slavery or, you know, the, the Guardian's record, something which in a way Catherine Viner has, you know, publicly acknowledged, the fact that it um, you know, it's it, its coverage of Abraham Lincoln's death. I mean, you know, it's its view supporting the right of the South to secede. To secede. This was really important for the, for a Manchester based paper lining up against the cotton workers at the time. It makes a difference. And to that extent, I don't think it's just like, ah, it's just a liberal paper. I'm, I'm a bit disappointed with it. It's wrong and it has an impact. OK, so we'll move in the same direction that we did with the previous question. Carol, do you want to pick either one of those questions to respond to or even both? Uh, I think I'll I'll stick with just the one that was directed at me. Um, it's a very good question about its relationship with the North these days. Um, I must confess, as somebody who moved to England about 25 years ago, I don't fully understand this whole concept of the North-South divide. It's a little bit baffling. <laughs> Um, but it's there and, and you could probably spend a lifetime trying to understand it. But The Guardian still does have a northern editor. It's Helen Pidd at the minute. So she does contribute regularly articles about things that are going on in the north. But it's nowhere near the, the Manchester paper that it used to be. Its coverage of the north is not as um, comprehensive as it used to be. Should it be? Yes, of course it should be. You know, there's an awful lot of, uh, as you said yourself, uh, political rhetoric about the north and the northern powerhouse. And that those of us who live here know is rubbish. It is just hot air. It is just wind at the end of the day. And um, possibly, again, I think The Guardian might be guilty of not really calling that out strongly enough and, and kind of reflecting itself on, on its own roots and where it came from and it's kind of allegiance to that part of the country. It would be nice to see a little more of that, I think. OK, and Aaron, I, I suspect your your work actually helps you to span the questions. Uh, how do you want to respond? Uh, OK, I'll start um, by just adding to what Carol said, which is although The Guardian um, was based in Manchester and of course, like as I, as I said, they deeply influenced the paper. I think we should remember that a lot of those at the top of The Guardian actually weren't from Manchester or at least went out of Manchester for their education. So the Scott family with CP and Ted went to private schools, went to uh, Oxford in CP's case, and a lot of the editorial team went to Corpus Christi Oxford and they were kind of brought into the paper because of its liberal values. Ted went to LSE. And they did immerse themselves within Manchester, but to a certain extent, they were kind of outsiders who were moving to Manchester because of their belief in liberalism and the, the Guardian was the paper to go to. So that maybe just complicates the issue there. On the issue of the Guardian's place, I mean, I completely agree with what Diora said, that 
at the end of the day, we need to look at the broader media context of the country and just the broader political and social context. Um, at the Guardian defines itself as a liberal paper. You've got the Daily Mirror, which still supports Labour, but it's in an incredibly diminished form. Um, you go to the, the sweeping changes of the post-war Labour government, and in the build-up to that, you had the Daily Mirror as, as one of the most vibrant, potent newspapers of the time, the Daily Herald, which became the most read newspaper in the world for a time. You also had other magazines like the Picture Post alongside the New Statesman uh, giving left-wing views. You had other Labour papers like the Clarion, the Labour Prophet, the Labour Leader, the Daily Citizen, at least for various periods. All of that has gone. And for the past few decades, we've had a media system where the press has been dominated by right-wing newspapers, both in the tabloids and the quality titles. And that just does, doesn't just distort public debate, I don't think, and it does. It also distorts other media concerns operating as well. So you get people recruited for these newspapers who are then moving between other press institutions. And I think it has an effect of dragging public discourse to the right uh, and it ends up influencing the BBC and things like that so how we fix this I don't know but you've got to hope that the rise of online uh, publications um, kind of open democracy um, byline times you've got to hope that these things continue to grow and help balance out the situation uh, it's you need these like these broader pushes to apply pressure you can't just hang it all on one totemic publication like the guardian and then get upset when it doesn't do exactly what you want it to okay thank you so much i think those have been some really comprehensive answers to two to two sets of very deep questions i don't see any more hands raised am i wrong about that um nor nor uh, nor anything in the chat do i have any more questions and it is lunchtime. Yes, it, it is. <laughs> but I did just want to be fair because I think it's been s such food for thought. Let's just see. Oh, OK, so it looks as if, you know, we've had a, a full intellectual meal here and <laughs> I'm, I'm sure <laughs> it, it's, it's quite a lot. So I'm sure everyone would like to take a break for lunch because there's so much more we're going to go on to talk about later today. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you to these three presenters. It's been a fantastic education for me. So wonderful to be exposed to work and to content that I wasn't aware of before. And I'm certainly going to incorporate into material that I'm going to be using in the future. So it's been wonderful for me as an individual, but I really think an important contribution to this event. So thank you very much, everyone. And hopefully many of you will be able to join us later again. Thank you all. Uh, yes, applause Thank to you. the presenters. Thank you. Thank you. See you, see you at 1.30 on Teams for the next two panels. Okay, then. Okay. Bye. Right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.